Um, and what I probably will try and do, just in, in the spirit of, of taking issue, is something that An Andrew mentioned on his slide, um, on one of the slides. It's sort of really unfair to pick a, a tiny snippet out and then sort of say, I'm not so sure about that. But uh, there was one point that sort of said, generally, uh, recruitment and retention, not a, not a problem. And I think possibly true of, of recruitment, but maybe uh, with retention, we might be in danger of underestimating the effect that certain things that could seem on the surface to be small changes either to terms and conditions of service or to the structure of, of the army or the armed forces, they, they might have a more profound effect on retention perhaps than, than some people can sort of speculate at the moment. Uh, what I do, I mean, I, I sort of feel kind of completely out of place standing here in front of a lot of important people, even more so than usual. But I, I, I can just get on the phone and talk to all my friends who are sort of still serving and who are all um, either that kind of platoon sergeant, uh, senior section commander, maybe staff sergeant, colour sergeant level, or who are all mid-ranking captains now all the way down to at Sandhurst and some of them even the, the dizzy heights of, of acting majors. Um, and I sort of say to them, look, what's, what's, the, what's the feeling? What, what do we think about this? What do we think about that? What would make you stay in the army? What would make you leave? Um, and a kind of very common response is that the idea that I could have any impact in this debate is a powerful driver away from the army. So they're all pretty worried that I'm here. Um, but certain things kind of do come up time and time again. And a sort of anecdote which, which occurred to me, which I think can kind of almost sum up everything I'm going to say, um, is anybody who's done... Uh, a kind of low-level subunit job like a company second-in-command in the army in the last 15 years will probably chuckle at the idea of investors in people. It's an absolutely standard thing that a company commander would get a company second-in-command to do to keep people occupied for about a week um, to tick a box so you could go into a battalion conference and pretend you'd been, been doing some work to the commanding officer. Uh, and everybody I know who did the same service that I did jumped through these hoops and got an Investors in People plaque up on the wall. Um, and, that, and you just don't think about it at all. Um, but actually, the ethos behind the concept of Investors in People um, is one that we should perhaps take more seriously. And I come on to this point that was made right at the beginning, kind of people as a capability. We, we paid this lip service to the idea of Investors in People and, you know, the last company in the battalion who didn't have this plaque on the wall, you know, they were in trouble. Um, but actually, it was just, you know, it was, it was just a plaque on the wall. No one's really thinking about it. We're still getting 18-year-old guardsmen in and, and sort of chucking them through systems and possibly as a result of, of the SDSR having an impact on whether they stay, whether they go, how their careers progress that we haven't really thought about. So I'm sort of keeping that Investors in People plaque um, up in my mind all the way through the talk. And, it, and I accept, um, as a civilian now, it's a really difficult balance for an armed forces um, because you can point to loads of amazing things that go on uh, in the private sector and say, why don't we do that, why don't we do that? And of course, the reality is that the armed forces ultimately will require things of its people that normal, conventional, whatever you want to call them, jobs, won't do. Um, I would say that is exactly why we also require a level of pastoral care, a level of investment in those people beyond, in certain circumstances, what wider jobs would consider normal. Uh, and this is a balance. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't come to a couple of the other earlier talks. I'm sure they touched on some of these issues, especially with kind of military covenant stuff. Um, so if I end up repeating what was said before, I apologize. But I, I, I suspect there's a lot of tie-in, particularly with sessions two and three, where you look at how we interact with a changing society, which will obviously impact how we recruit and retain and train. Uh, and then also the covenant between the society and the military and, and how they interact. Um, now, the question today, if I've sort of understood it in kind of simple sort of infantry officer terms, is, is actually quite narrowly, how will the SDSR impact on recruitment, retention, and training? And then I sort of translate that through my sort of slightly cynical filter into actually the question is, how can we minimize the adverse impact of the inevitable cuts that will come up out of the SDSR? Um, and I think that's where, again, this little kind of shiny investors in people thing is, is important because... People, again, we pay lip service. Oh, yeah, people are the most important asset. Oh, yeah, our people, that's our second priority after Afghanistan or whatever. Um, but actually, you've got to think more carefully through what that actually means, who your people are, and also kind of how unpredictable they are. Because what you can't do with people, which you can do with kit and equipment, and, and I know absolutely nothing about kit or equipment or procurement, but you know, you know if you order Eurofighters without a fighter ground attack capability that it's going to be X cheaper, unless you have to buy it further down the line, um, but it's also going to reduce your capability by X amount. You can't do that with people. The guys that I'm speaking to and saying, 
you know, how do we feel about this and that. Some of them are saying, if you take away boarding school allowance, I'm going to have to leave the army. Some of them wouldn't think that was a problem at all. Some of them are saying, as was mentioned there, you know, sport is the reason why 78% of people were, were saying they joined the Navy. Some of them are saying, we're going to lose our sports afternoons. I want to know who the people who still have sports afternoons in the armed forces are. But the point, point is, there are all these kind of different subtle drivers. And with people, you don't know what the response is going to be. It, it's not as simple as just saying, if we take away a battalion, we've reduced this much capability. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to sort of to get at is... The fewer people we have, um, the more pressures there are exerted on the remaining people. Um, and the problems then kind of exacerbate, and they kind of seep out. And, and I sort of shamelessly use my own former um, regiment, the Grenadier Guards, as a kind of good example, because operational tours is a headline, and frequency of operational tours was a headline, and the idea that you should get a certain amount of time in between operational tours was something that kind of became very current and political. And actually, our, our commanding officer sort of quite cleverly managed to chuck up a slide in a few presentations which showed how busy we'd been. And we'd, you know, as a battalion, a single, infantry, uh, single battalion infantry regiment, we'd send a company uh, to Kosovo in uh, 2003. The battalion had gone to Bosnia in 2004 to 2005. It had gone to Iraq in 2006. It had gone to Afghanistan in 2007. And it had gone back to Afghanistan for 2008-2009. It's way, way outside any of the sort of harmony guidelines. But actually, that, that wasn't really the problem. Uh, and this is where I come to the point about recruitment, not necessarily a problem. Infantry battalion, young men, that was kind of what they'd all joined the army to do. Yes, it was starting to put pressure on guys' families, on guys' personal lives, all those drivers you saw on the earlier slides of why people leave. But actually, that was kind of fine. Um, I think that's something that sort of, I hope, comes out slightly in my book. That was kind of what people wanted to do. What started to gripe people, um, what starts to wear people down, what become those drivers away, um, are the fact that that's not the only times you're going to be away. Uh, and it's interesting because we're talking about training slightly. The absolute best training I ever received and hopefully that I ever delivered was from people who'd just come back from Iraq or Afghanistan or when I was that person who'd just come back. There's nothing worse than being sat on Salisbury Plain preparing to go on a deployment, being taught by somebody from OPTAG who hadn't been to the operational theater that you were deploying to. Uh, and that, and we, we've changed that. We've recognized that. And you now have this brilliant thing where operational training packages are delivered by the people who literally a month ago have come back from those specific theaters. But of course, if you're delivering that training package, that's another three weeks that you're not at home in all the shot, that you're out in, in, in Stanta or, or you're down in Salisbury Plain. And, and so everything kind of becomes interlinked in this sort of jumble where when my commanding officer put, the former commanding officer put this slide up, the nights out of bed thing was insane because it wasn't just the operational tours and it wasn't even, again, just delivering training and receiving training to go on them. You then think, well, hang on, that's an eight-year, sorry, five-year block, 2003 to 2008. If everybody's been on operational tours and they've been training the people following them and they've been being trained by the people before them, when have any of them done a career course? Do we have any people with the qualifications needed to drive the new protective mobility? No, because that's a three-week long course and you can't spare anybody on a three-week long course. So again, you have this kind of massive, massive impact um, in very, very subtle ways that affects people in ways you can't necessarily quantify in the same way you can go, if we kill this number of tanks, we won't have that number of guns in the field. Um, and I think that's, that's my kind of guiding thing. I don't particularly have solutions. I, I wouldn't kind of dare to, to pretend to. A few sort of ideas spring to mind, um, and I'm, that's kind of more, more we, can, we can more fruitfully talk through afterwards. But I gave, I was very kind of flattered to be asked to give a lunchtime lecture uh, here about a year ago. That's possibly when, when the rot started. Um, and it was sort of a crossover between what we're talking about in this session, and I, I suspect what you were talking about in the last session, about this widening gap between society and the military, um, and the Generation Z, Generation Y thing. The Army actually identified that in, in a paper, um, except it labeled us the MP3 generation. And it specifically identified what it expected to be problems in recruiting and training the MP3 generation, my generation. Um, and my suspicion is that actually if we, we look at some of those potential problems, they, they actually don't have to be problems. They can be quite positive things. Um, and they can be things which, if we harness them, can deliver efficiencies, the sort of efficiencies that everybody's desperately scratching around to find in the current environment, without um, taking the more drastic steps, which, which my sort of colleagues who are still serving w would say uh, have potentially damaging consequences. Now, it's very interesting, again, right at the end of, of, of Andrew's presentation, there was talk about thinking outside the box. And this is kind of, again, it's another phrase everybody pays lip service to. Um, but it's, 
reading sort of reports of the, um, you know, I think the, the phrase was industrialized special forces operations that went on in Iraq in 2006, 2007, sort of joint um, American and US uh, things. Um, one of the lessons that they seem to identify um, that General Stanley McChrystal kind of specifically mentioned had been identified was devolving decision-making until you were uncomfortable, not just down from senior officers to middle and junior officers and maybe from junior officers to senior uncommissioned officers, down as far as you could go and then even further till you're uncomfortable. It's the sort of thing that we pay lip service to I don't know if we do it enough. Um, General Dempsey, in his Kermit Roosevelt lecture, one of the six things he identified as a lesson sort of we have to learn going forward is, is leadership development. Uh, and in America, what they're doing is they're kind of looking at getting uh, officers out of the military for periods of time, kind of broadening experience. I would suggest that all these things, greater devolvement of responsibility, getting people broader experience, are exactly the sort of drivers that are going to appeal to my ambitious contemporaries who are thinking, hmm, should I stay, should I go, and want that extra nudge to get them to stay in an organization and kind of devote their, having been recruited by those drivers, patriotism, adventure. Getting to that point where thinking, actually, now this is, a, this, is, this is no longer something I'm doing with my early 20s. This is now about to be a career. Am I going to make it a career? At the moment, if you're a, a kind of uh, a sat at an SO2 job, probably slightly, I mean, my, my former company commander, again, very anecdotal, stupid case in point, but this is the sort of thing that annoys people. He did two years doing primary health care in Camberley before taking command of a rifle company in Afghanistan. And you've got to wonder, was that the best use of his time, of primary health care's time, of manpower? Um, ha, ha, why could he not, perhaps, as has been proposed, spend more time on regimental duties before going out into the wider army? There are little things which I think if we harness... Um, can increase that sort of efficiency and, uh, and then perhaps sort of sidestep some of the more drastic options. Um, John Wilson uh, did a, a series of articles for British Army Review, which I strongly recommend to absolutely everybody, about the way we live now. And he identified changing social patterns, how they're going to impact on the army. Um, I would suggest, uh, having never served there myself and obviously having not been involved in armour, that the move slowly or however slowly or not slowly it is of bases from Germany back to the UK will have a positive effect on some elements of retention. I think the super garrisons will have a positive effect because in 2010 you can't say to a 29-year-old Lance Sergeant, right, your two years of, in order shot have finished, you're off to Tidworth, uproot your entire family and your wife who's probably got a job that pays more than you anyway. Um, so it, it, it's these little things. I, I'm making a kind of impassioned plea to A, remember the investors in people thing, um, and, and B, to instead of thinking society's changing, our people are changing, and they're changing in a bad direction because maybe they're more ambitious than they used to be, or maybe some of the, some of the things they do, they do differently. We can harness those things, um, and we can make them better. And I'm going to finish with a kind of real curveball, I suspect, just because it'll get people sort of talking, and because I promised that I'd, I'd say something different from everyone else. The Sandhurst intake is changing dramatically. It's, it's commonly cited 85% graduate intake, um, but actually, more interesting than that, compared to when it was only 15% graduates, is the type of graduates those people are, because more and more people are going to university, and I can't remember who said, but it was brilliantly said, uh, that the battle in Helmand will be won not on the playing fields of Eton, but on the astroturf of Loughborough. We are moving, uh, as politicians have sort of famously said, towards a society where we're all middle class. And a lot of the structures that permeate the army um, are still predicated on a supposition of class distinctions which frankly don't exist through a lot of the armed forces anymore. I don't know yet why certain jobs that traditionally only junior officers have ever done couldn't be done by equally intelligent senior non-commissioned officers. I don't know why there isn't more free interplay, especially within my narrow field, which is in the infantry, where people could do each other's jobs. I had as much in common, much though this caused a bit of kind of jowl wobbling in the Cavalry and Guards Club, with my platoon as I did with the other guys in the mess. And that's true across the army, and it's only going to get more true. If we're looking at ways, if we're scratching around for ways that we can be innovative in our training, if we can be innovative in our recruitment and retention,